and welcome back to Second Opinion. I'm Eli Stokels. I'm joined by Dr. Patrick Soon Shong, the executive chairman of the Los Angeles Times. Dr. Soon Shong is a surgeon and scientist who has spent his career studying the immune system in order to fight cancer and infectious disease. He is also the chairman and CEO of the biotech company Immunity Bio, which is developing a COVID-19 vaccine currently in trials here in the United States and in South Africa. He is also the owner or investor in other companies researching treatments for COVID-19. In our episode tonight, averting the next disaster, the pandemic has been the ultimate stress test for healthcare worldwide. From medical equipment shortages in the U.S. to a vaccine shortage in Africa, the coronavirus exposed critical gaps in public health locally and globally. And those who were hardest hit were invariably those with the least means. Lower income neighborhoods in cities across the U.S. and lower and middle income countries as well. With us tonight are two guests researching and uncovering disparities in the public health sectors here in America and abroad. Elizabeth Rosenthal is a veteran journalist and physician who now serves as editor-in-chief for Kaiser Health News. She's written extensively on how America's healthcare system has been starved of desperately needed investment. But first, we'll speak with Dr. Peter Hotez, the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. He is also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. He has spent most of his career researching vaccines for what scientists refer to as diseases of poverty, infectious diseases much of the world has ignored or neglected. Take a look. My name is Dr. Peter Hotez. I'm a professor of pediatrics and molecular virology, Baylor College of Medicine, where I also co-direct our Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's Hospital. And I work on developing vaccines for poverty-related neglected diseases, but also now the coronavirus vaccines for the last 10 years, including a hopefully low-cost COVID-19 vaccine that's being scaled for production in India with our collaborators at Biological E in Hyderabad. Right now, all of our vaccines are in various stages of clinical trials, including the COVID-19 vaccine. And some of our vaccines, we never got the funding to really continue. An example of that is our SARS vaccine. We made that, manufactured that vaccine, but we never got an investor to move it into phase one clinical trials. My op-ed article in, in the LA Times really focused on the fact that despite best efforts by the policymakers, at the end of the day, we still do not have a lot of vaccines to offer for low and middle income countries, especially for Africa. We need to be able to have vaccines made locally for local distribution. So Africa, for instance, could make not only their own COVID vaccines, but for vaccines of regional importance on the African continent, that are not necessarily global and therefore will never be made by the big pharma companies for diseases such as schistosomiasis. It affects 40 million girls and women living in extreme poverty. It causes pain, bleeding, social stigma. It's a risk factor for HIV AIDS, and yet nobody hardly even knows about it. You know, female genital schistosomiasis were affecting, you know, up to half the girls and women in you know, you name it, Los Angeles or Paris, we would never tolerate as a society, but because these are girls and women living in extreme poverty in some of the poorest African nations, you know, it flies below everybody's radar screen. I have a lot of young people that come and see me or talk to me now, of course, via Zoom and Skype, and they say, hey, Dr. Hotez, I want to be like you. I want to develop neglected disease vaccines or vaccines for poverty related diseases. And, and they're often very disappointed when I tell them or suggest to them to get an MBA, a, a business degree, because, you know, we need as much innovation in the business sector as we do in the sciences. And Dr. Hotez joins me now. Thank you for being with us. It's good to see you. And it's fascinating work that you and your team are doing at Baylor. Your COVID vaccine is in clinical trials right now. And I guess I'd like to start with asking, have you started on a plan for distribution yet? Well, we're uh, finishing these phase two trials right now, and uh, hopefully we'll go into phase three. We'll get that green light. And we're in discussions with the Indian regulators because this is being accelerated in India with our partners there, Biological E and 
so far everything looks like it's a go and and the hope is that by the summer uh, potentially we can start distributing uh this vaccine uh, our our partners in india biological e have committed roughly about three quarters of the doses for the COVAX sharing facility, which is the international body that's been created to ensure equitable distribution of the vaccine. But we're also in discussions now with uh, groups in, in Indonesia and South Africa. And our hope is that this vaccine could become one of the world's first low cost uh, people's vaccine for COVID-19, because by some estimates, uh, we think we could do this for a dollar fifty uh, a, a dose, which is uh, one of the least expensive COVID nineteen vaccines. So, very exciting times. We're also very scary times because uh, we don't have a lot of durable, low cost vaccines for Africa and Latin America and other regions of poverty in the world. You know, the policymakers very much looked after the United States and, and Europe, and and hopefully we could fill that gap. 12% of America is now fully vaccinated. Millions more will qualify this week as the states begin to expand uh, eligibility criteria. But it's obviously a different story for billions of others around the world. Can you expand a little more on the, the disparity here? Well, you know, for instance, uh, the, the, the workhorse so far for the United States has been the two mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, and they're great vaccines. And I, I, I received the uh, Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine, and, and I know now I'm not going to go to the hospital or the intensive care unit, and there's even evidence that could slow transmission. That's the good news. The not so good news, it's a brand new technology. Uh, it's difficult to scale production. It re has a pretty onerous freezer chain requirement. And while Pfizer BioNTech is willing to provide 230,000 doses to Rwanda, for instance, let's look at the scale of this. Uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa has a population of 1.1 billion people. We're assuming most of the vaccines are two doses. We're going to need two, 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to meet the needs of Sub-Saharan Africa. Who's going to produce that? It's not going to be uh, those two mRNA vaccines. And even though there was a well-intentioned effort by the policymakers to ensure equity, the truth is the vaccines aren't there. So Hopefully, the uh, adenovirus vaccine uh, from AstraZeneca Oxford will play some role, maybe the J&J &J one. But even then, uh, it, for reasons that we can go into, it, that, that may not be adequate. So a vaccine like ours, which is an older technology, I think would be a very welcome addition uh, to that for Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. In other words, uh, a, a vaccine specifically designed for resource-poor settings. There was some initial pushback, though, to distributing a low-cost vaccine to low- and middle-income countries, and that pushback came from richer nations like the U.S. and the European Union. You write, the fact that no new vaccines are made in Africa or in many other low- and middle-income countries reflects profound lapses in international science cooperation and diplomacy between wealthy and poor nations. This will soon have catastrophic consequences. Tell us a bit more about what you mean by those lapses in cooperation and diplomacy between the poor and the wealthy nations. We hear a lot these days about vaccine nationalism, uh, which I imagine plays into the dynamic you're describing at least a bit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, the, the multinational pharmaceutical companies, uh, in, you know, they, it's not that they've, they've ignored the world's low and middle income countries, but for new vaccines, that could be specifically designed for the needs of low and middle income countries. That's not the priority of the multinational companies. And the point of, of the op-ed was to say, you know, it's now time to build capacity in places like Africa or to expand it in Latin America or the Middle East so they can make their own vaccines, not only for pandemic threats like COVID-19, but also for important diseases of regional importance. And, and many people are astonished to learn that no new vaccines are made on the African continent. Uh, and, and we need to build that capacity in order to respond to emergencies rather than this dependence on the multinationals and, and the hope that something filters down to the resource poor countries. That, that's not a recipe for success in fighting these global pandemics and, and for diseases that are diseases of regional importance in Africa, like as was mentioned, female genital 
schistosomiasis or Borrelia ulcer, the multinationals are never going to produce those vaccines for, for Sub-Saharan Africa. I want to bring a second doctor into this conversation here, Dr. Patrick Soon-Shong. Uh, Dr. Pat, on previous episodes, we've reported on the risk of allowing countries in Africa to struggle to get access uh, to the vaccine, right? Well, look, I couldn't agree more with uh, Peter. I think an unvaccinated Africa, as you said, is a global threat. Um, and if we don't recognize that, even in a selfish way, where we should really be more selfless, and, and the work that Peter's been doing, I, I'm such an admirer of, it's called neglected tropical diseases. Think about that word. Why are we neglecting these billion people uh, of humanity? And it's outrageous that there is no capacity in Africa. So I think that's exactly where we need to go. And what Peter's saying is, is, is correct, and, and, and not only correct, it really is something we really need to address because we see these mutations and we'll get to that. But Peter, I'd like to ask you about an interesting event that happened just recently with Senator Rand Paul, who um, accused uh, Dr. Fauci of theater for wearing a mask after vaccination. You want people to wear a mask for another couple years. No. You've been vaccinated and you parade around in two masks for show. No. You can't get it again. There's almost, there's virtually 0% chance you're going to get it. Well, let me just state for the record that masks are not theater. Masks are protective. And we you have ask immunity there, theater. If you already have immunity, you're wearing a mask to give comfort to others. Senator you're Paul, not you're wearing a mask I because of like any Dr. sign. I, I totally disagree with you. I think us as scientists understand <clears throat> it's not theater whatsoever. Uh, these mutations are dangerous. They are happening not only in South Africa, but now the ta in Tanzania, even a new mutation. So give me your thoughts on that, on this concept of this disinformation about this theater con uh, comment that was made. Yeah, ab absolutely, Dr. Patrick. You know, I was just aghast that Senator Paul made those comments. I mean, here's a member of the Senate of the United States Congress, who, and, and he's a physician, so he should know better. I mean, we know now that we're not out of this pandemic in the United States by any means. We're starting to see this steep acceleration now of this uh, variant that came first came out of the United Kingdom last September. We call it the B117 variant. It's more transmissible than anything we've seen before, and it has a higher disease mortality. That came out in Nature magazine just a few days ago, and, and studies out of Denmark showing higher rates of hospitalization. And, you know, we, we're, we are making progress in vaccinating the American people, but it's slower than we'd like. Only about 21% of the U.S. population has gotten uh, a single dose of, of vaccine. So we still have a huge swath of the American people who are vulnerable to this. And all we really have at this point is, is wearing masks and, and to be so tone deaf to that. And, and, you know, one of the things that we've now noticed is, and I've been following this for a long time, because, you know, as you know, I've been going up against anti-vaccine, anti-science groups, because I have a, I'm, I'm both a vaccine scientist and I have a daughter with autism and intellectual disabilities and, and wrote a book called Vaccines Did Not cause Rachel's autism that sort of made me public enemy number one. And unfortunately, this has been a long saga going up against these anti-vaccine groups, and it accelerated in 2015 by linking to the, uh, to the Republican Tea Party. So it re-energized the anti-vaccine movement, and now part of the political allegiance to uh, political extremism on the right is to say that you're not in favor of vaccines and, and now they've glommed on protests against masks and social distancing. This is causing a lot of disruptions. Let me ask you a different question. I think what tortures probably you and me, and I come from South Africa, I was born there, understand the schistosomiasis, hookworm, uh, areas that you talk about, hundreds of thousands and millions maybe of young girls infected with these uh, genital warts, etc., where nobody cares about. You spent your career on this. Why do you think this remains so elusive? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, a terrible tragedy. This is a condition of, we estimate, 40 million girls and women 
living in extreme poverty. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people talk about the plight of girls and women living in poverty, but here is what's arguably the most common gynecologic condition in the African continent. And it goes completely ignored. It's called female genital schistosomiasis. It, it happens when these the parasites that young girls and women contract by standing in infected water um, over the years become infected. And then uh, the, the female uh, worm deposits eggs that go into the uterus, cervix, and, and lower genital tract, and it causes pain, bleeding, social stigma. Adolescent girls get it. They're often accused by the local health workers of sexual promiscuity when, in fact, they got it by washing their clothes uh, in contaminated water. Uh, it's been linked now to a big increase in getting HIV AIDS. It may be the most important uh, cofactor on the African continent for acquiring HIV AIDS. Uh, it, it's, it's now uh, been linked to unipolar depression, uh, marital discord, and stigmatization. And, and as, as was said in the, in the opening, you know, if this were a problem in the United States or Europe, we would never to tolerate it as a society, but we allow this to go on. And, and so this is what we're trying to do, develop the vaccines for the conditions that no one else will touch. And an important one is this condition, female genital schistosomiasis. And, and the point is the science is there. Uh, we have the science to know how to make a vaccine. It's, it's a failure in uh, the business model, a failure in equity to recognize that girls and women who live in extreme poverty are deserving of innovation and, and life-saving vaccines just like any other group. We launched the second opinion um, which was an opportunity for us to have thought leaders like yourselves speak to big challenges that affect all of humanity. And I want to thank you because you inaugurated our second opinion. And for those who maybe didn't read uh, that op-ed piece, maybe you could actually, uh, Peter, for as we close here, give us some of the solutions that you actually raised in that second opinion piece. Well, thanks. I mean, first of all, I think this is one of the really important aspects of second opinion, because the kinds of diseases and the approaches we're talking about, you know, it's not a 30 second UNICEF commercial. It, it takes time for people to understand and, and it has some level of complexity. And, and in this case, what, what uh, I think is so important is to build innovation and create capacity on the African continent and elsewhere as well, in some parts of Latin America, in the Middle East, poor countries of Asia, but uh, overwhelmingly Africa, to build that capacity for, uh, so that Africa can make their own vaccines. And, and the key here is it's not simply bricks and mortar. It's not building a factory. It's, it's not building uh, a, a plant only. Of course, that's important, but it's training the human capital because vaccines are, are a fragile biotechnology, as you know better than anyone. And, and it requires training, not only in the science, but also the quality control, the quality assurance. And in Africa, we need to build that capacity as well. And I think we can do it, uh, but it's not, it's not quick. It's gonna take a few years to do it, uh, but I'm very excited about the possibility of, uh, of this happening in the not too distant future. Well, at least, um people like yourself, and I'm personally committed to, to doing that, and um, imagine us developing standards that are equivalent to that of the FDA in Africa and exporting vaccines from Africa to the rest of the world, which is really the vision. So, Dr. Otez, thank you so much for your service and your work, and Eli, back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pat. Uh, and it's obviously an important discussion, and one we will continue to have here on Second Opinion, and I wanna add my gratitude uh, to Dr. Peter Hotez for joining us. You can read his op-ed on the global threat of unequal vaccine distribution at latimes.com slash second opinion. And before we go any further, you may have noticed that we have made a few changes here at Second Opinion. Dr. Patrick Soon-Chong, you just touched on the, the fact that we've uh, switched things up a little bit. You wanna tell uh, our uh, audience a little more about the changes? Well, the changes were to have people like Peter and people like uh, who actually have done things in the world. I call it a do tank versus a think tank, i.e. people who have actually not just participated in policy, but really uh, have made major impacts and can address what we consider 
global challenges and big ideas. And as Peter said, it's not a soundbite. You need to explain and have an opportunity to have the space to write and for people to consume. So every weekend now on Sundays, uh, we have a dedicated page, um, half page, on the op-ed section. And that's where the second opinion will not only reside, but together with shows like this. So it'll be both video and mobile and, and, and print. And that's the, the, the forum now for the second opinion. Well, it's great to give uh, thought leaders in science and uh, medicine that kind of space. Journal as a journalist, I certainly know uh, I appreciate uh, having the space to, to go along on a story. Uh, and I think our next guest does as well. Elizabeth Rosenthal is the editor in chief of Kaiser Health News, the author of An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. She had a brief career as an emergency room physician in New York City before making the switch to journalism. She was a correspondent for the New York Times for 20 years, reporting on various beats, including healthcare. And she left the paper in 2016 for the position at Kaiser Health News. Elizabeth Rosenthal joins me now. It's really great to have you here. Thank you for, for coming for on. Thanks for having me. Uh, you recently wrote an op-ed for the LA Times, and in it you say that America is now paying the price for two decades of underfunding healthcare. And you go on to note that since 2010, spending on local health departments has dropped by 18%, and at least 38,000 state and local public health jobs have disappeared since the 2008 recession. It is a scary picture, especially now that we're in the middle of a pandemic that no one was counting on. How did the pandemic supercharge these problems and perhaps expose them uh, in a more obvious way uh, in terms of medical care here in the United States? Sure. I, I think the pandemic, uh, when COVID came, it was a stress test on our public health system and our health system generally. And we failed pretty miserably. And as we saw very early on in the pandemic, uh, you know, hospitals didn't have ventilators sitting in excess in the basement because our hospitals are mostly uh, not for profit, but they they operate like businesses. Uh, the government didn't have them because they didn't have a stockpile. So we saw this huge gaping hole, both in terms of testing, um, in terms of ventilators, in terms of PPE that had been allowed to gather for 20 years. And um, it, it was really tragic. I think one of the statistics that really sticks with me every day is we've now experienced well over 500,000 deaths from COVID, uh, one of them my own mother. Um, and meanwhile, you look at the death statistics in some of the Asian countries, in Taiwan, I think about 25 million people, 10 people have died, 10 total. So it shows you what having a good public health system can do and what we are missing. Yeah, indeed. And, and let me just say, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your mother. I know so many folks uh, have lost loved ones uh, over the last year yeah. uh, and it's really terrible. And you know, a lot of the human tragedy, uh, as you write, could have been avoided had there been some of these investments in the public health infrastructure. You mentioned the dearth of PPE and ventilators. Are there other specific investments uh, that you're referring to that would have made a big difference here? Well, sure, just people, you know, people on the ground with technology on the ground. I mean, many public health departments, I think I said in the piece, it's, it's you know, a skeleton staff working with a fax machine. You see in countries that do public health well, uh, they have, you know, contact tracers. They have technology that tells them, uh, that allows them to track the spread of COVID and quarantine it so it stops spreading earlier. Um, we just didn't have any of that. And even worse, what we saw uh, at Kaiser Health News, we did a project with the AP called um, Underfunded and Under Threat. The few public health officers that were out there encouraging people to wear masks, trying to do contact tracing, um, from much of the right, they were abused, they were threatened, they were, uh, you know, their families were threatened because it was said they were promoting a hoax. So not did we, you know, not only did we underfund them, un underappreciate the, the very hard work they were doing, but we threatened them, which is, I mean, it's just crazy and so sad. 
Dr. Pat and Dr. Hotez talked about some of the ways in which this has been politicized in the last uh, segment. And I just wonder, in terms of you know the global picture, is, is the United States sort of unique in seeing this virus and the pandemic and public health politicized in such a way that, that wearing a mask has become a statement about your politics? Is that unique or is, have we seen that in other countries? I don't think we've seen that in other countries. And I actually lived as a New York Times correspondent in China during SARS. I mean, mask wearing is is quite normal in much of, much of Asia. It's what people do when they're ill to prevent the spread of disease to others. So I think it was much easier to get that um, uptake there. But really, it's not a big deal. We, I'm here in New York now. Everyone's wearing a mask. But what was very strange in this country is how wearing a mask became a political statement. And, you know, that likely caused, you know, I can't count how many deaths. You mentioned having been a Times correspondent in Beijing during the SARS outbreak. And you had two young children at the time, I understand. Uh, Mm -hmm. You were sort of a pioneer uh, of sorts (laughs) in, in pandemic parenting. Uh, something that now everyone in the United States who has kids has probably uh, become accustomed to. Uh, do you have advice for today's moms and dads, or any did did the experience then, uh, you know, affect how you decided to adapt and 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 handle the coronavirus pandemic? Well, it made it in some ways easier. You know, many of the families uh, at my kids' school in Beijing decided to send their kids back to their home country. It was an international school. Um, we decided to stay. The kids got really good at, you know, um, personal hygiene, washing their hands, uh, respecting others, wearing masks when we were in crowded places, um, which we had to avoid because much of much of Beijing was shut down. So, um, and I think it taught them, they're now both in their 20s, a good life lesson about you don't always get to do what you want. It's not a big deal to put on a mask to protect others. And uh, they both lived in Brooklyn through much of uh, the COVID pandemic. And they were really good citizens. I'm really proud of them. Uh, I want to bring Dr. Patrick back here. I know that, uh, Dr. Pat, that you have a few questions for Elizabeth as well. Well, Elizabeth, uh, first of all, my condolences for your mother. And I think the empathy of what you may have now of how dangerous this disease is, right? And I think you wrote in, the, in our op-ed that our country should spend more on the war in nature versus the war in terror. Yeah. I think the, one of the most important statements you made is respect for others. I think that's maybe one of the issues that wearing a mask is in fact respect for others. Um, and then when you talk about healthcare has now become a big business with the way you wrote in your book, uh, as opposed to really caring for your health. Um, I, I've been struggling myself, you know, when I came to this country from South Africa and my first patient I saw at UCLA in the emergency room and, and went back to go get a glove and then turned around, he was gone. And I said, where's my patient? He said, you didn't have insurance, they would have taken him to county. And I said, this is ridiculous. So this is where, this is where there's this dichotomy. We're the greatest country in terms of innovation. We're the greatest company in terms of technology. Think about it. We, inv- we invented the genomic sequencing technology. Yet we were 43 behind. We were behind Senegal in sequencing the COVID virus. What do you think will change now? That what have we learned from this pandemic? And where do we go from here? Well, I I think two things. You know, the first thing is since 9-11, we were very focused on international terrorism, human-born terrorism, rather than nature-born terrorism. And I think we overinvested in that and forgot, you know, what all the infectious disease uh, experts were saying is that there could and there will be a, a global pandemic and we have to be prepared for it. And, you know, because there hadn't been a big infectious disease outbreak in the United States since HIV AIDS, we were kind of like, oh, yeah, we've done that. Now we've solved this infection problem, these infectious disease problems, you know, wrong. We always we always deal with the problem in front of us. And that's that's how politicians get elected. 
Um, and I think the second issue you bring up is our system is very much determined by we trust that the profit motive will do the right thing for innovation and for healthcare, and it does some wonderful things, but it also leaves some huge gaps that a different kind of approach, whether it's a, a public sector approach or um, you know, a different way of thinking about the rest of the world approach and the rest of our society approach, um, whether it takes that, we, we need to fill in those gaps because, you know, you, you made the, the uh, distinction between kind of the thinkers and the doers. I started as a doer and I worked in a New York City emergency room and so many of the problems I was seeing really weren't medical problems. They were problems of society that we just hadn't dealt with. So I went to the other side and now all I say when I go talk is all I can do is write and talk you guys should be doing something. But I think, you know, uh, projects like uh, Dr. Hotez's, um, there's a lot of goodwill out there, but it has to be funneled in the right direction. I, I think we can't just say as journalists, like, what does this mean for people on the Upper West Side of Manhattan? We need to think about what it means for the world. And I hope that's what our stories try and do is to illustrate that this person doesn't look like you. They may not have as much money as you. They may not be well insured, but they deserve to be healthy and to have their needs met. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. And I'd like to also thank Elizabeth Rosenthal for joining us today. Please make sure to read her op-ed on COVID and the US healthcare crisis at latimes.com slash second opinion. Dr. Pat, our guest today informed us about critical life and death problems facing millions of people worldwide. We also heard some solutions. We always like to end on a message of hope. What did you think about today's conversations? Well, I think the hope we bring with today's conversations is people like Elizabeth and Dr. Peter Hotez are not only thought leaders in their fields, uh, real practitioners, clinical scientists, public health officials who are begin to now begin to speak up. And the hope is that we will provide uh, this forum that what we develop, what, what they're speaking about, affects all of us. The hope is, in fact, frankly, when you talk about these hundreds of thousands of young girls with schistosomiasis, most Americans don't even know what the word even means about what it does to these young, young girls. This idea of cervical cancer, HPV, viral infected cancers, uh, is that people like uh, Elizabeth and Peter now will have a forum to speak up. And we as a, as a, as a paper, through Second Opinion and through shows like this, Eli, would hope to know, inspire, and actually move politicians beyond, just as Elizabeth talked about, the short-term thinking and the myopic thinking. Uh, I'm tortured by the fact that we had this national preparedness facility uh, at Texas A&M and spent tens and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars and kept it empty uh, before COVID hit. And um, the hope is that our voices uh, and your voices and people like Elizabeth and, and uh, Peter now will create a wake-up call for this nation um, as we proceed. Well, these conversations we all know are certainly vital given uh, what we're all living through at the moment. and. We're glad that uh, we have this forum uh, to have them here, uh, you know, online in terms of having a, a show uh, and also every Sunday in the paper, you can find all the second opinion columns uh, in the LA Times and online at latimes.com slash second opinion. That does it for this episode of Second Opinion. Uh, for Dr. Patrick Soon Chong in Los Angeles, I'm Eli Stokels in Washington. Until next time, goodbye.